welcome to the part 2 of the lesson on numerical solutions to the thermal field and fluid flow in welding. We are choosing the control volume approach for the discussion on this numerical solutions because it is uh, the same method we have used to derive the governing equations and uh, the overview of the process uh, that is the entire process of solving the numerical uh, the equations discretizing and the algorithm that is used for solving the linearized equations is the objective of this particular lesson. And uh, we would uh, um, go beyond what we have covered in the previous lesson namely we will be able to take the advective term into account and also look at how the velocity field can be solved. So, the reference remains the same as the first part of this uh, lesson namely the book by Suhas V. Padankar. The book is titled Numerical Heat Transfer and uh, Fluid Flow and this book uses the terminology and the symbols for the various quantities exactly the way uh, we are uh, showing in this particular lesson. And therefore, if you have this book handy then you can map on this lecture with the book so that you can understand further details that were not covered in this lesson from the book. So, the outline is as follows we are going to start off by just quickly looking at the governing equations that we need to solve. Uh, this is just to refresh your memory from what we have discussed in the previous lesson and then uh, go beyond the 1D problem that we have discussed in the previous lesson. Namely, in this uh, lesson we will look at the 2D and the 3D geometries and how the uh, linearized set of equations would look like. And then uh, when we want to apply uh, the tridiagonal matrix algorithm for 2D and 3D then what kind of an approach should we take. So, that is what we are going to discuss and then uh, how to discretize the advection term and uh, whether or not the linear interpolation scheme that we have discussed would be valid here is going to be looked at. And then in the end we will wind up by uh, making some comments on the high performance computing aspect of these simulations mainly because when we go to three dimensional uh, problems then the computational time is quite significant. So, regarding the geometry aspect for welding uh, I must actually confess at this stage to say that the way we are discussing the solution of these equations is not very different from any other discussion on the computational fluid dynamics course. For example, it is the same set of equations we are solving and the solution procedure is also the same. However, there are some geometrical aspects that are peculiar for welding because of which we want to discuss some of those things in this course. And uh, one thing I would like to say is most of the times the welding is done in a flat geometry that is we have the uh, vertically downward going the uh, gravity direction, we have the transverse uh, velocity of the torch which is normal to it and the plate is actually extended in the direction that is normal to both of these. So, in other words most of the time the welding can be considered as a three dimensional problem and uh, one may uh, reduce this problem to two dimensional uh, only under very limited uh, set of assumptions and usually it is a three dimensional problem. And uh, in some uh, limited situations such as in spot welding uh, where the torch is not moving uh, you may assume that the problem is axisymmetric so that you can solve perhaps uh, just a 2D problem and uh, get uh, reasonable uh, solutions. But then it is at least uh, with the three variables namely the x, y, uh, uh, r theta for example and the time uh, because its uh, problem is transient in nature. Uh, in the case of uh, continuous welding uh, particularly of uh, dissimilar joining for example it is necessarily uh, four dimensional namely it is all the three dimensions of the space and with time also the evolution of uh, the thermal and velocity field is taking place. So, therefore, naturally welding is a, a complex problem when it comes to the numerical simulations. So, the generic form of the equations is given here we uh, have already seen these, but just let us quickly uh, find out the meaning of these terms. Uh, let me just choose the pen here. So, the first term is the uh, uh, transient term and the second term we looked at is the so called the advection term. The third set of terms is basically the diffusive term and the last one is basically the source term. So, with these four terms then the equations are going to be similar for all the quantities that we want to solve for. However, uh, we can see that when we go from the temperature field to the velocity components, the meaning of these terms can change slightly. I have recognized there is a small typo here, this must be uh, V and this must be W, otherwise rest of the things are same. So, what are these uh, source terms? Uh, 
is something that you could uh, look up. Uh, we have uh, discussed that in the previous uh, lecture and there is the same set of uh, terms that we are going to use now. There is a convention that we must follow when we go from one dimension to three dimension and that is being uh, shown here. Uh, we use the words east and west when we are talking about the, the x direction. So, that when we talk about east which means we are in the plus x direction and when we say west we are in the minus x direction. Similarly, for north south we have uh, the y axis uh, used for it and the words top and bottom are used for the z axis. So, the uh, subscripts like E, W, N, S, T and B are used to represent basically the neighbors of any particular given location within the domain. Okay. So, here is where we are showing you how the grids are laid out. The uh, rectangular region that is shown here which I am going to hatch, this region is basically the control volume we are talking about. Okay. So, the control volume phases are then la uh, labeled with uh, small letters that is E and W, N and S. So, these are the east, west, north and south phases of the control volume and then the uh, locations where the parameters are specified with values are given with capital letters. So, that is these are the locations where they are specified as the neighboring locations and we are writing the discretized equation at the location of interest namely P. So, P is the location of interest where we are writing the equation. And if we choose to have the discretization such a way that the width of the control volume is different along x and y directions, then you would have delta x and delta y separately written and you could also have them different for different locations. That is as you move along x direction, the width of the control volume can also be chosen to change. Okay. And uh, we have seen in the uh, previous lesson that when we discretized the equation, we saw that the one dimensional uh, problem has come with a linear set of equations and in the case of two dimensions, we are going to have the same set of linear set of equations, but with more terms. So, we can see them here uh, that in one dimension you would have for example, only the i index coming in. So, you would have only the i coming in here, but uh, in the case of two dimension you also have the j index uh, coming in here and you could see that you have instead of two neighbors we are talking about basically four neighbors and when we are writing the equation for the variation of temperature at this location then you would see that it is given in terms of the neighboring temperatures weighted by factors which are basically in this equation given as B i j, C i j, D i j, E i j respectively uh, for the four neighbors and these are basically uh, thermal conductivity uh, taken with a ratio of the distances uh, between the control volume phases. So, you could see that the linear set of equations are looking in a same pattern and these equations are then written for indices of i and j going from 2 to n minus 1, where n is the total number of control volumes along each of the directions. And in the 2D, we are writing the equations now uh, with the same terminology as given in the Partankar's book and you would see that the coefficients are having uh, the, the coefficients are having the same uh, meaning as in uh, the earlier uh, slide, you will see that the thermal conductivity is given here and then the distance between the control volume phases is given here. And you could see that these are So, these are all basically giving you uh, the uh, weight factors uh, by which the neighboring temperatures are going to be uh, averaged out to get the temperature at any given location. And you could also see that the four rules that we have uh, set as uh, to be valid for uh, this particular approach uh, that is also can be verified here. You could see that the uh, equation written here is such that when the source term is not present then uh, the coefficient of uh, the uh, Tp uh, is going to be sum of coefficients of all the neighboring uh, values. So, this is one of the four rules that we have discussed earlier and also the fact that all the coefficients must be positive and you can see that all the coefficients here these are all going to be positive and uh, we only need a uh, question mark on uh, this particular term and we saw that uh, Sp is always negative. because uh, the source term linearization is generally to lead to uh, 
uh, temperature coefficient sp uh, as a negative. So, you would also assure that the coefficient ap will also be positive. So, like this we can verify that the discretization was done correctly and once these uh, coefficients are all available then we have the uh, linear set of equations ready in two dimension. In three dimension it is a straightforward extension and uh, they look the same way except for that the coefficients are going to have more terms that are coming in. So, you could see that you have more terms coming in uh, here there are two distances coming in uh, otherwise it is the same uh, coefficient as in uh, 2D and here also you would see that there is a minus sp here and uh, sp is negative uh, and therefore you would see that the coefficients are all positive and ap is then sum of uh, the coefficients of all the neighboring temperatures and uh, that would also be valid when the source term is zero so you can see that uh, it's a straightforward extension from uh, 1d to 2d and 3d when it comes to this kind of a, an approach uh, when you are using a regular grid a structured grid in uh, three dimensions uh, in the control volume approach and uh, one must then uh, also now relook at the way of solving. Uh, we have mentioned that in 1D uh, you could also perhaps think about inverting a matrix uh, uh, which is going to be of uh, size square of the number of grids. So, so, if you have a 1D problem with 10 grids then you basically have a matrix of size 100 by 100, but then out of these uh, 10,000 elements uh, uh, very few are non-zero because you have got the a matrix as a tridiagonal tri matrix which means that only three diagonal uh, rows are uh, having non-zero elements and rest of them are all zero. So, therefore, though one has the option of inverting the matrix for direct solution, it is not a very efficient way of uh, solving. However, in the case of 2D and 3D, uh, it becomes almost impossible to think of a direct solution. The reason being as follows, if you were to choose a two dimensional problem of 100 grid points along each direction, then we are talking about a matrix of coefficients coming to 10,000 by 10,000. So, that would be a very huge matrix which is very difficult to invert and when you go to 3 dimension, uh, you would be multiplying uh, by another 100. So, you are going to talk about a million uh, grid points uh, uh, and then you have uh, a matrix that is million by million in size and definitely direct solution is then uh, not possible by inversion of a matrix. So, any iterative uh, uh, solver is only uh, recommended. So, a tridiagonal matrix algorithm is basically an iterative process and therefore, we are going to basically recommend to use a TDM algorithm uh, and uh, the advantages are that it is memory efficient as well as uh, it is also computationally much much faster. And uh, here is the algorithm we have already seen it in the previous lesson, but I am just showing you here to just refresh your memory and we can see that we can write the uh, algorithm as follows. We can uh, see that on the top uh, you have got the elements uh, here and uh, normally the first element is known because it is from the boundary condition and then you have the inner condition, outer condition. So, you have basically uh, between these three you can evolve an equation that will have only two uh, unknowns and uh, that is the kind of equation that you are trying to write here. And you can then uh, uh, solve for the one of the temperatures and then write the equation for the next two and like that you can keep going till the last row. And in the last row you already have one solution from the boundary and therefore, you can evaluate one of the temperatures and which will back substitute and then come back to solve all the temperatures. So, so you basically have this idea of forward substituting so that your equations are having only two unknowns and then later on you are going a backward substitution so that you can solve for the temperatures which will be coming out in the reverse direction from n minus 1 to n minus 2 to up to 2. And you can see that the way we are doing it is possible only when you have only one direction in which you are going to do the forward substitution and backward substitution. Whereas, in the case of a 2D problem and 3D problem you do basically have two or three different directions in which you need to do this. So, what is the modification of the algorithm that we are going to do? So, essentially what we are going to do is this following. So, we are going to actually set the values of say j and k to be fixed. Let us say take uh, j is equal to 2 and k is equal to 2 and then you can then sweep i uh, from 2 to n minus 1. So, that way you can solve uh, using TDMA. Uh, when you have the values of temperatures uh, in the second j row and the second uh, k row available, then you can go ahead and uh, 
do the uh, uh, TDMA iteration. And normally you always have the initial guess values available therefore, one can go ahead and uh, try this out without any problem. And with successive iterations you are coming closer and closer to the solution and therefore, upon convergence you can say that the equation has been fully satisfied. And uh, this is actually illustrated by uh, the following schematic. You can see that what we have done uh, here is basically uh, we are taking the uh, uh, line by line uh, TDMA basically we are taking the first row and then uh, solving the TDMA along the row and then we can then go to the next row and then solve it. So, like this row by row we can do the solving and we can actually also change the direction. So, initially we can do uh, forward substitution and backward substitution to get the values along this row and then later on you can get for the next row and so on. And uh, later if you like you can also change the direction of sweeping in this manner also. And which direction should we choose first? That is governed by basically uh, what is the direction along which the uh, temperature is varying the fastest. And uh, if you are going to sweep in the vertical direction you would do it when let us say this is the domain when this is the heat that is coming in. So, if that is the heat that is coming in then you know that the temperatures are going from top to the bottom fastest. So, if you are going to iterate TDMA in the vertical direction first, then your convergence is going to be slightly faster. So, this way line by line TDMA can be applied for 2D and it can be also extended to 3 dimensions. Okay, so, here we have just summarized the uh, technique of uh, solution of the linear set of equations. Uh, initially, we will have the initial conditions available or we will have the previous iteration values available or previous time step values available. So, these are basically the initial guess values. So, once the initial guess values are available, then we will choose to pick values for j and k indices and then sweep the TDMA uh, algorithm over the index i and then we will get the solution and then we can then shift the sweeping direction from i to j. That means, you can keep the values of index i and k constant and then sweep along the index j and then we can do it over uh, the index k also. And like that if you have totally 6 sweeps of TDMA, then you would have uh, swept the solution process in all the 3 directions in both forward and backward directions and therefore, you would get basically a solution that is almost converged. So, you can actually check whether the convergence actually is achieved or not and then choose to do one more set of 6 such sweeps of TDMA. So, line by line TDMA is the way to solve the linear set of equations. Uh, to solve these equations uh, in 2D and 3D. So, how do you know that your uh, the solution is correct in the sense it has converged? The right idea is as follows. The star is basically to indicate uh, the this is to indicate the previous iteration. So, the idea is as follows so, compared to the previous iteration in the current iteration how much is the relative change of the parameter. If the relative change is less than a particular amount of uh, percentage then you can say that the convergence has been achieved. So, let us say if you took delta as 10 to the power of minus 3 we are talking about 0.1 percent change. So, if the variable has come uh, to change not more than 0.1 percent in an iteration then you may choose not to iterate any further and this basically comes to something like 1 Kelvin change in the temperature when the maximum temperature is about 1000 degree centigrade which means it is pretty good estimate because even experimentally the accuracy of a thermocouple or a pyrometer is not better than 1 Kelvin when you come to temperatures above 1000 Kelvin. So, basically you can choose the uh, cutoff for the convergence criterion as you like something like 10 to the power of minus 3 is generally practiced and you can choose what is the maximum residual available in the entire domain check whether it is within a particular threshold and if it has come then the number of iterations you have done is adequate and you can stop iterating and move on to the next time step that is how you can say that the convergence has been achieved. And uh, these convergences should not be tested only against the uh, convergence criterion um, mainly because sometimes it may happen that the choice of your time step or the direction of sweeping etcetera may not be uh, appropriate and therefore, you may need much more number of iterations. So, instead of waiting for the convergence to come you may actually check whether the number of iterations you have done uh, for the convergence is adequate. So, let us say you can put an upper limit of say 100 iterations. So, after 100 iterations if it does not converge you would just stop and then come out of the loop and then check what has gone wrong. So, that we do not have the programs going indefinitely into the computing. Uh, 
and sometimes these limits of convergence can also be adapted. What I mean by that is let us say if you take welding then uh, during the process of heating uh, fluid flow is actually not happening because there is no molten pool yet. So, therefore, what you can do is you can have a higher, uh, higher limit of convergence because only the temperature variable is going to be uh, changing and later once the melt pool starts to form you may have actually a very strict convergence criterion so that the velocity profiles are accurate because they can change the thermal field significantly. And once the weld pool is fully formed and the velocity profile is basically set, then again you can uh, enhance the convergence criterion limit so that uh, you are not very strict about the convergence mainly because the velocities are not changing uh, very much uh, beyond some stage. So, like this you may adapt the convergence criteria as you go along, but at every uh, such change you must also validate whether uh, what changes you are making is only for numerical, uh, uh, numerical speed up or uh, is it also going to change the uh, solution numbers significantly and by validating these results against the experiments within the experimental errors uh, you can actually take a good decision to make the numerics uh, reasonably fast. And uh, what are the measures that we can take to ensure convergence? We have just discussed a few of those points, but I am summarizing all those points in one slide here. We can do basically by uh, choosing to solve that variable which changes the fastest. So, among the variables that you are going to solve simultaneously, if you have temperature, the three uh, velocity vectors and let us say even the composition variable, then you can choose to start solution of that variable which changes the fastest. Usually it will be the temperature which will determine rest of the flows. Therefore, temperature can be used to solve the first uh, variable. And then while uh, doing the TDMA sweep, you can actually do the sweep in such a direction that that is the direction in which the variation is the fastest. In the case of temperature for example, in the direction normal to the plane on which the heat source is applied is the direction where the heat is actually flowing. So, that is the direction in which temperature is changing the fastest. And therefore, if you use the TDMA sweep in that direction first, then you would come to a converged solution of the temperature fastest. So, that is one more thing you can do. Sometimes your convergence is not happening quick enough and lot of time is being uh, wasted in uh, the iterations, then you may want to consider lowering the time step. For example, if you uh, take the time step to be half of what you have used, you basically end up in twice the computational time because you would have two times the uh, number of time steps that is required. But then if it uh, cuts down the iterations by more than 50 percent, then surely you have saved the time of computation. So, one can take a call on the time step variation also. And then uh, control volume, uh, number of control volumes also can be refined. For example, uh, if the grids are not fine enough in the region where the variation of the uh, parameters is happening uh, very quickly, then also would uh, result in the convergence being slow. So, you may want to go back and see whether adequate number of grid points are available or adequate number of control volumes are available in the location where the variation of the parameter is fast. Uh, namely for example, in the fusion zone and heat affected zone for example and then go back to solve with a refined set of uh, grid points and you would see that the convergence would be again uh, speedened up. And uh, there is another measure that one can do, this is a last measure and not recommended generally, but can be used uh, numerically without causing any artifact that is basically what is called the relaxation parameter. So, the relaxation parameter is basically this quantity. What it means is basically you have already seen that T p is supposed to be equal to uh, this quantity. This is actually supposed to be T p, but what we are doing is that we are looking at the difference between calculated T p and the previous iteration T p and then the difference is being added to the previous iteration with a scaling factor alpha and this scaling factor alpha is it more than 1 or less than 1 would be calling by the name as over relaxation or under relaxation. So, let us take under relaxation you have got 0 0.7 as the parameter alpha which means basically if the temperature at a particular location is supposed to change by 100 degrees then I will not change it more than 70 degrees at a time. So, that over successive iterations then I am not changing it as much as the numerical solution is asking me to do and that way I can slow down the changes and uh, hope that the convergence is faster. And what is the result of uh, a relaxation parameter? Does it actually change the solution? Actually not. The reason being that when the convergence is completely achieved, then this entire difference is 0 because T p is supposed to equal to that. So, therefore, upon convergence uh, 
uh, the factor after alpha is going to be 0 and therefore, there is no change in the value of any uh, temperature at any given location. Therefore, uh, under relaxation or over relaxation will not change the solution. However, it will change the rate at which you approach the converged solution in an oscillator manner or in a uh, monotonous manner and whether it is going to be quicker or slower. And one may have to play with this parameter for a given problem to identify what is the best choice of this relaxation parameter alpha. So, these are all the various measures that one can do, so that the convergence can be achieved fast in a iterative uh, solver such as line by line TDMA with alternating direction. Okay, now, uh, let us uh, spend some time on uh, the idea of uh, convective diffusive equation and how we can take care of the convective uh, term uh, to uh, discuss on the interpolation, because this basically is the crux of uh, the solution of uh, the uh, Navier-Stokes equation upon uh, reduction to one dimension, it basically comes as convective diffusive equation. So, this is the uh, convective term and this is the diffusive term. So, this uh, equation if you want to discretize there is one particular aspect that we are going to do. Essentially, the problem is as follows. So, phi is available at the locations that we have specified okay. and we are asking a question here let us say I want to know what is the value of phi here and uh, normally uh, in the previous discussion where we have looked at only the steady state or unsteady state heat conduction without the convection, we were, we were taking into account linear interpolation. However, when you have convection linear interpolation will not be valid and that is what we are going to see in a moment. Okay. So, the previous equation we are basically applying the control volume approach to integrate over the control volumes and therefore, you basically uh, come up with uh, this equation and uh, so this equation you come up which basically tells you that uh, after integration you have the terms which are going to be evaluated at the uh, phase centers of the control volume and then uh, we can then look at uh, how the values are going to be used. And you see that naturally you have a need to evaluate the phi at the phase center and you knew that phi is actually available only at the center of the control volume. So, you have a requirement of interpolating the value of phi at a location in between the locations where it has been uh, provided. And uh, once you uh, then gather the terms you again come to the same kind of a uh, linear set of equation like this, but then uh, you need to see how to interpolate and uh, that discussion is uh, then uh, carried forward by uh, using just two um, short forms of these terms uh, uh, f and d, so that we can reduce the algebra. The first up attempt to do is basically to take the simplest of the uh, methods basically which is uh, to say that we will use a linear interpolation. Now, if you use a linear inter interpolation what happens is that uh, you would encounter uh, erroneous results whenever there is some convection. In other words as the velocity is going in either plus direction or minus direction the value that you find which is average is either overestimated or underestimated. And you will also see that the four basic rules that are to be valid for the numerical solution will also be uh, invalidated because you would not have the uh, all the coefficients to be positive uh, for the uh, linear set of equations. And uh, this can be then analyzed and you can see that it is happening only when the Reynolds number is large. And if you were to use for example, Gauss Seidel iteration method not the TDMA method, but Gauss Seidel method then uh, there is a stability criterion for uh, by the name uh, Scarborough criterion and uh, this also will be invalid. So, essentially we can say that a linear interpolation method is going to be uh, giving you erroneous results for high Reynolds number problems and it is also not going to be suitable for Gauss Seidel iteration and it will also invalidate some of the basic rules of this particular control volume approach where we have the coefficients to be all positive etcetera. So, therefore, linear method is going to be uh, not recommended for interpolation uh, in the solution of these equations. So, one method by which we can remedy some of these artifacts that will come because of uh, linear interpolation is by using what is called an upwind scheme. The upwind scheme can be understood as follows. Essentially, it is like this. Let us take the flow to be in one particular direction okay. and let us say that uh, the variable that you are talking about is temperature. 
and we look at two locations, the location P and the location W. The idea is as follows, if the velocity of the liquid is quite high, then the temperature uh, felt at a particular location in between is closer to temperature at W, okay, because this liquid is actually carrying the enthalpy from W all the way up to P and as it comes closer and closer to P, then it would take a temperature that is uh, changed by P. But then for most of the distance between W and P, the temperature is going to be close to what has at W. So, which means that you could actually approximate that the value of temperature at any location between W and P to be that of W itself. Okay, such a approximation is called as an upwind scheme and this approximation can then be given mathematically by using this operator which basically is to say that what is the maximum of these two values. So, so whether are we taking the um, velocity um, affected temp, uh, temperature from the left side or right side is depend upon the sign convention of the velocity. So, that is the reason why we have got these two expressions. So, should we take the uh, value from the east face or west face uh, that depends upon the direction of the flow and the upwind uh, direction is what is being chosen as the value. So, which means that we are not at all averaging, we are only taking the value from the previous neighbor and we are looking at the direction of the flow and picking up the uh, correct uh, uh, neighbor for which we are going to take. And uh, this scheme has been successfully shown to remove the artifacts that were caused by the linear interpolation scheme and therefore, this can be used if one wishes to. The third uh, way is to actually solve analytically uh, what would be the value of temperature when there is a flow that is induced. So, what kind of a problem has been solved to arrive at this solution? That problem is basically as follows. If you have uh, two walls and you have got temperatures T1 and T2 and then you have got flow in one direction, then what would be the temperature at any location intermediate? So, this location uh, this temperature at an intermediate location can be obtained as a deviation from the averaging between T1 and T2 and that can be given as an exponential function and that has been so solved new, uh, analytically and this can be done uh, quite straightforward. And once this is available, then you can use this relationship to find out what is the temperature here. Okay. So, this can be then x. So, you can see that the analytical solution, exact solution is actually exponential and therefore, you can see that naturally you should not be having a linear interpolation being meaningful at all and the exponential can be always approximated as a, an upwind scheme in this following manner. If the temperature variation is like this, then the exponential variation is like this, then you can see that this value can be approximated as this value okay. and uh, you could see that in the uh, asymptotic uh, part of the exponential, you can always take the value to be the end of the asymptotic, which means that T at this location x can be taken as T1 itself and that is exactly the upwind scheme. So, in other words, you can say that the exact solution or exponential uh, uh, interpolation is basically a more general and more correct form uh, compared to the upwind scheme and this can also be used. Uh, the only problem of uh, using this in the interpolation scheme is because uh, exponential function is an expensive computation. So, uh, the computer is going to spend uh, several cycles to compute uh, the exponential value uh, if your uh, processor is uh, not intelligent enough and therefore, you would actually be wasting computational time calculating the exponential function again and again. And this has to be done actually at every grid point for every iteration of every time step and which means that it is going to be the function that is going to be used maximum in the entire computation and therefore, uh, one should avoid it if uh, one can and that is the reason why we have a hybrid interpolation that will be coming in uh, in the last part. So, how are these various uh, uh, exponential solutions uh, going to look like? You can see that uh, the variation from x to l uh, is given by these various uh, curves. You can see that when the Peclé number is positive or negative. I will just show you the direction of the flow. You can see that uh, the value uh, is to be taken. This is basically when the flow is this way. So, you can see that this value is valid for most of the distance and only when you come closer to the other point, you start having the value of the um, location on the left hand side, which means that when the Peclé number is large and negative, then for most of the time, you can actually take the right hand side value. And if the Peclé number is large and positive, for most of the distance, 
you can take the value from the left hand side. So, whether we take the left hand side or right hand side depends upon the direction of the flow, which means that upwind scheme is actually uh, sort of uh, proven uh, as uh, a good approximation by this exact solution. And uh, what is the case under which a linear solution, linear approximation is valid? That is a special case only when the Peclet number is 0, which means that when the velocity is 0, that is pure conduction. So, only in a conduction problem you can take linear interpolation of the temperature values in between locations, otherwise you should not take linear interpolation, you should use one of these methods where exponential relations can be used or upwinds can be used. Now, upwind scheme as we said has a problem of exponential function which is expensive in a computational scenario and therefore, we can choose a hybrid uh, solution and a hybrid solution can be then approximated in the following manner. The exact solution is given uh, by this curve which is basically uh, showing you the exponential variation and uh, you can see that uh, you can approximate the exponential part in some portion uh, using a minus p value and in intermediate portion uh, using uh, this function and a later portion using this function. So, you can actually approximate the exponential function in uh, 3 regimes by using uh, 3 parts of the function and this can be then used to save the computation that is to be done using an exponential function. So, this uh, can be used as a hybrid scheme and that is what is given here. So, hybrid scheme is basically choosing uh, the uh, 3 forms you can see here the 3 portions of the exponential function which then can avoid having to calculate exponential at all and just by uh, a, a simple algebraic uh, uh, manipulation of the uh, 2 quantities d and f you can actually evaluate what be the coefficient. And then once the coefficients are available the linear form of the equation is quite straightforward which can then be used uh, for uh, the further processing for the uh, calculation of the linear a set of equations. So, so, this way you can actually see that the hybrid uh, scheme is going to save computation time very close to being accurate and also avoids the artifacts that will come from the linear interpolation scheme. And uh, it is actually also found that when the Peclet number is less than 10, uh, it actually saves a lot of uh, uh, effort in the computation. Okay. And where should we locate the variables? So, this is again another discussion. Uh, the idea is as follows. If you have a checkerboard pattern of uh, pressures, then because the pressure term is coming in the uh, Navier-Stokes equations as just only single uh, differential, you can see that you normally have only this term, whereas in the case of velocities you have a double differential. right? So, basically what it implies is that you are going to have a central differencing when it comes to the uh, velocities and you would have forward differencing when it comes to the pressures and therefore, you may have a situation where a checkerboard pattern of pressures may lead to no flow and that is absolutely not correct because whenever the pressure is changing the flow must be happening. And this kind of an artifact can be avoided by choosing to have the uh, variables u and p located uh, differently that is the pressure can be located at the center of the control volume and u can be located at the faces. So, you can see that the pressure is located here. So, this is where the pressure is and u is located here. Okay. So, when you do this then upon interpolation etcetera then you would not have a situation of a checkerboard pattern being stabilized and uh, one can look at more details of such artifacts coming uh, from the book by Partankar. But at this moment I would say that there is a case to use what is called a staggered grid and the staggered grid is in such a way that u is staggered along the x direction, v is staggered along the y direction and w is staggered along the z direction and uh, this is staggered and p and t are at the center of the cv okay so we can see that by locating in this manner you can avoid artifacts and that has been done in these schemes uh, to uh, ensure that the solution that you get is very accurate and this uh, also brings into one complexity that has been addressed by a, an algorithm that has been proposed by uh, Partankar. Uh, the complexity is as follows. So, you have the equations which are written for temperature, the u velocity, the v velocity and the w velocity. So, you have basically a number of variables for which you have to solve. You also need to solve for pressure, but then there is no explicit equation available for pressure. Uh, 
and therefore, when we have a difficulty in choosing what is the order of solution that we can have and what kind of a guesses we can do for the pressures and how we can correct the effects of pressure on the velocities etcetera. So, this uh, complex problem has been solved by an algorithm that is uh, called as simple algorithm, uh, simple not as in the exact meaning, but it is an acronym for semi implicit method for pressure linked equations. It has been developed by Patankar and this has been very successfully used in fluid flow problems, where we are able to get solutions in a very reliable manner in an iterative manner. And the algorithm itself is uh, outlined here, the uh, idea is as follows, initially we have to guess what is the pressure field, because we do not have an explicit equation for pressure. So, we basically guess it as 0 everywhere. And then we have uh, the solution of uh, momentum equations that we can use. Once the momentum equations are available, then we can uh, obtain what would be the changes in the pressure because of these uh, initial guess values of the momentum. So, in other words, it is basically the u star, v star, w star. Once you have, then you can obtain what would be the change in the pressure. And then once you change the pressure, then you can also change how much is the correction required for the velocities. And then when you add those corrections to the uh, initial guesses for the velocities, then you get the uh, correct velocity and then you can iterate this again and again. So, in other words, you use this scheme, this scheme of this as a loop till convergence. So, this uh, loop of uh, uh, steps that has to be followed basically four steps, uh, uh, guess the pressure, uh, then get the first guess of the velocities, then correct the pressure and then the correct the velocities. So, these steps can be then done again and again in an iterative manner, so that all the four quantities namely the u v w and pressure are solved simultaneously and the convergence will then be obtained and we can check for that also. So, this algorithm has been used successfully to calculate the flow field in various geometries and definitely in the fusion zone for weldments, it has been also used and uh, uh, I can uh, tell you that it has uh, given uh, accurate results and you could also then uh, apply it for any other welding scenario. And uh, what are the welding specific issues that we can discuss on uh, the liquid flow? Uh, the idea is as follows, uh, during welding the fusion zone is not always present, uh, during the heating it actually forms and during the cooling it actually disappears. So, so, in other words the domain, the region of the domain in which liquid flow is going to take place is going to actually appear and disappear during the solution and this is not the same as any other uh, CFD kind of an approach where the liquid domain is always present. So, therefore, one must take care, the take uh, steps to ensure that uh, the phase change has not been missed. That means, uh, a control volume should not escape melting and flowing the melt uh, because of a wrong choice of the time step. So, ensure that the time steps are very fine, so that the liquid formation has been captured, so that the liquid flow also has been calculated properly and its effect on the temperature variation also has been done properly. So, initial stages of the flow development must be done very carefully because they are going to affect the temperature variation. And uh, there is another complexity unlike in many of the CFD problems in welding, you have multiple driving forces acting simultaneously. So, you have basically a very complex fluid flow happening, you have marangani flow, you have the buoyancy flow, solutal and uh, thermal buoyancy, thermal, uh, thermal marangani as well as solutal marangani and uh, you also have electromagnetic uh, uh, forces induced convection uh, also taking place and added to that you also have the heat source having a pulsed nature. So, you basically have fairly complex uh, uh, fluid flow happening in the weld pool and what is worse uh, you cannot actually visualize it directly during the welding process, because most of the time the welding is at such a high temperature that the liquid pool is incandescent, it is sending out so much light that it is very difficult to visualize it uh, with uh, camera techniques. So, so, basically you have a complex problem with very little validation, so you have to ensure that the solution procedure is as accurate as you would have it. And uh, whenever we do the solutions, also ensure that the solutions are not depend upon the choice of the grids. In other words, if you make the grids finer, then the solution does not change. And also with the time steps, if you make the time step smaller, then the solution does not change. So, these two tests have to be done on the solutions before we can uh, call them as uh, uh, accurate and uh, solved. And we must always benchmark the results of these solutions with works done by others and we also should validate them with the experiments that we can do for the problems that we are doing to ourselves. And in the case of programming, there are a few steps uh, as an extension to 1D, you have basically uh, 
uh, multiple arrays that have to be stored because it is a three dimensional problem we are looking at here. So, we will have as many arrays as the number of variables and also as many arrays as the number of coefficients for the neighbors. So, in other words we have uh, for the three velocities pressure and uh, temperature and pressure correction we have got about six variables out there and then for the five neighbors uh, we have got uh, four neighbors and one at the center for 2D and uh, six neighbors and one at the center uh, we have got seven uh, arrays for the coefficients and if you are going to take a transient problem you will also have to store the arrays for the previous time step as well as previous iteration. So, you basically have a fairly large amount of uh, memory footprint for these calculations and you have large number of arrays that will be stored and each array will be uh, n by m by x where uh, these 3 n, m and x are the uh, dimensions in the 3 dimensions. So, which means that if the array is going to be uh, if you have for example, a 3 dimensional array uh, which has grids of uh, let us say 100 by 100 by 100 uh, grid points then each of these array is going to have a million uh, data points that are going to be stored and uh, you can see that very quickly uh, you would uh, exhaust the memory of most of the current day workstations and one must also take care uh, to save space as much as possible. And uh, we must also write the uh, various pieces of code of uh, solutions uh, separately so that we can manage the program better and we must have the uh, solutions run one run of solver per variable which means that we will have if we are going to solve for temperatures and uh, pressures and the velocities you can see that first you solve the temperature and then you solve the um, simple algorithm that means the sequence of uh, pressure correction then the u star and then the pressure uh, uh, changes and then the uh, u corrections and in this loop you can do it and then after that you come to the composition uh, solution. So, you have a particular sequence of solving the uh, equations and then you follow the sequence again and again to iterate so that all the equations are simultaneously solved for in a numerical manner. And this has to be done for every time step and uh, each time step has to be done uh, and updated with the time so that you can see how many time steps you have done whether the time is up to say that the simulation has completed. And uh, at any number of m number of steps you can say that I will uh, put my uh, output and then you can then use that output to uh, visualize the temperature, velocity fields, etc. So, this is the overall scheme by which you do the programming uh, to simulate the uh, weld pool temperature and velocity profile evolution. And what are the various ways of doing it? This is the same as what we have discussed in uh, uh, 1D. Basically, you can write the programs in Fortran, C or C++. Uh, normally, because of uh, the complexity uh, as well as because of the speed required for the computations, uh, one does not write uh, a MATLAB program or a Python program uh, to solve these equations in three dimensions. Uh, uh, a low level language uh, such as Fortran or C can be used so that you can make the uh, program run as fast as you can. However, uh, with uh, accelerators uh, today, you can run them in a high level language such as Python or MATLAB also. Uh. And uh, usually the input values have to be read from a file. So, you must have file input output also taken care. So, you would have usually the grid spacings and the parameter values coming in from a file input. And the output will then be written in a binary format usually because the files are quite big and then they are then post processed using a graph plotting software such as techplot or MATLAB or Paraview etcetera. And this is the overall scheme, this is how it is going on. Basically, we have the uh, equations, then we have discretized them, we have got a linear set of uh, uh, equations, then we took care to ensure that the interpolation scheme is done properly, taking the advection terms into account and a hybrid scheme is used so that uh, we do not have too much of uh, computational uh, expense done. And then they are then solved using a TDM algorithm, so algorithm is then programmed in the programming language such as Fortran or C and then that program is then compiled to create an executable and then the executable is run and then you get the output and then output is then visualized in a software to produce uh, a, an output which you can uh, view such as this. For example, you can uh, see that in this situation you have got these uh, contours uh, of uh, temperature and you also have basically vectors of the liquid flow. So, you can then combine and then see how the uh, weld pool is going to uh, evolve and uh, look at how the output is going to uh, give you more learning about the process. So, this is the overall scheme by which we are doing. At this juncture, I would also bring uh, one last uh, concept in namely the high computational cost. As you can see that in a 3D transient run, you could easily have about a million grids or more 
and you have a thousand time steps or more. So, very soon you start seeing that you have to solve the equations about a 10 to the power of uh, 9 times uh, over you know every location and every time step. So, you are talking about a very huge uh, computational cost and we are talking about uh, several hours or even days of computation depending upon the problem. And uh, each time step can then involve multiple iterations for convergence and uh, these are also me memory intensive as well as CPU intensive. So, therefore, one uh, good approach would be to make the program as a parallel program so that you can make the computation faster. And uh, whenever we do it in parallel uh, method, you basically uh, have two ways of doing it. One is what is called as uh, the uh, multiple instruction uh, method where you send different pieces of code to the different computers. You can solve for example, pressure equation in one computer, velocity equation in one computer, temperature equation in another computer etcetera that is one way, but that is not recommended. The reason being that we do have an algorithm which actually mixes and matches these solutions. What is recommended is actually multiple data single instruction kind of an approach which is SIMD approach and uh, uh, that requires you to use a demand decomposition, decomposition to split the data across the processors and that can be done. And how do we then send the data across to other processors? So, there is a standard available which is called as a MPI library, message passing interface library and using that you can actually write a program whereby you can send parts of the array to other computers to compute and then collate the data after the computation is over so that you can mix all the data and write the output file. So, this is an approach that is required whenever you want to do large problems. And uh, what I have said is illustrated here, if you take the data as a, a 3D array of uh, grid points on which you are going to do the solution, then you can actually for example, split it into three parts and then uh, send them to three different computers and then make those solutions and mix and match. So, we have already seen from the TDM algorithm as well as from the linear set of equations, we need the data from the neighboring nodes. So, whenever you take a slice of a array and send it to one computer, the neighboring nodes uh, data has to come from the another computer which is neighbor. So, you basically have what are called ghost nodes hmm, which are basically uh, these ghost node planes basically replications. Okay. So, the same array will be available in both the computers so that the data is replicated and this data replication is taken care by MPI and that way you can actually uh, handle uh, this particular problem quite neatly to compute uh, across multiple processors and uh, make a welding simulation reasonably fast. So, with that we come to the end of uh, the second part of the lesson on numerical solutions and we would then follow it up by looking at actual solutions of temperature and velocity field to give you an idea of what kind of output is possible and we would do that uh, as a set of slides in a third part later on. With that I will close this lesson and thank you.